as you can see up here right now is a quote from uh, Josh Letterberg, uh, who's uh, President Emeritus and uh, Nobel Laureate here from Rockefeller, which says, the single biggest threat to man's continued dominance on the planet is the virus. And obviously, sort of coming to grips with viruses is something that <clears throat> scientists and biomedical researchers spend a lot of time thinking about. So um, sort of in the after lunch uh, portion of this, we're going to talk uh, more about, sort of less about the, the sort of nitty gritty molecular biology of viruses and a little bit more about things that have to do with the, uh, the bigger picture. And so we'll, we'll just start with a few clips here. Can you have the lights down a bit? The most optimistic projection you, Sam Ridd, is willing to make for the spread of the virus is this. 24 hours, 36 hours, 48 hours. So that's pretty fast. Does anybody think that's realistic? No. Fortunately, you're right. How do viruses get around? There are many different ways. So viruses um, can get around in a lot of different ways, as we've seen. So this is a sort of classic uh, diagram from an infectious disease thing. So we've got the respiratory route that you saw here, the fecal-oral route. Ho hopefully these aren't too graphic for you. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, this, this includes uh, viruses like rotaviruses, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, can cause uh, outbreaks in daycare centers of diarrhea. There are the uh, sexually transmitted viruses, herpes simplex and uh, HIV. Uh, there's, there's one that's actually not listed here in terms of, uh, of specifically human infections, and that has to do with uh, viruses that are transmitted by blood, contaminated blood. For instance, hepatitis C, which has now been virtually eliminated from our blood supply, used to be transmitted by people that needed transfusions with contaminated blood. Fortunately, that's no longer a problem. A lot of viruses get around by people that use in injection drugs um, and exchange needles. Then there are sort of more complicated viral life cycles where it isn't sort of a simple human-human transmission, where there are others in involved. So this is a case where the virus is arthropod transmitted. So viruses like yellow fever, like West Nile, Japanese encephalitis, tick-borne encephalitis, um, these are arthropod uh, transmitted diseases. Those viruses are sometimes called uh, arboviruses. Um, and then there are sort of more complicated uh, situations where viruses are actually in an animal reservoir like rabies and then occasionally get transmitted to humans uh, and can cause disease, but there's, there's no sort of human-to-human -human transmission. So humans are, in this case, a, a dead-end host. And then there are other kinds of more complex arbovirus infections where, um, again, insects are infected, uh, like mosquitoes or ticks. Uh, 
and then other vertebrates can be infected by the uh, bite of those insects. And that is actually the major natural uh, niche of those viruses. And yet, occasionally, uh, mosquitoes can, or ticks can, can bite a human, uh, leading to infection. But again, there's no, no sort of human-to-human -human, uh, transmission. So there are a lot of different ways that viruses uh, can get around in, in nature. So you know, some of the ones that, that uh, you've heard about, um, and there are, this is one of the things that uh, I think is very interesting in virology, and it's also good for virologists, is that, uh, as I said before, we don't really know all the viruses. We don't really know uh, what's going to pop out. But some of the ones that have um, are Ebola, which I think uh, you're all familiar with, and that is the sort of uh, genesis of the outbreak uh, movie clips that you've been seeing, Matumba virus. SARS coronavirus, which basically uh, broke out in Asia and spread, um, fortunately, to a, a few other locations in the world. And we may not be seeing the last of, of that virus, which can cause very severe um, respiratory problems and fatalities. West Nile, which we've had uh, sort of a local experience with this. This is actually quite a, an ancient virus uh, that uh, has been in the Middle East for a long time. We'll talk more about that later. Monkeypox. Um, now, this is a, a, a cousin of, of the virus that caused uh, smallpox, variola major, minor. It's, it's found uh, in Africa and infects a wide variety of different mammals. And I'll show you an example of a little problem that we had with that a couple years ago. Influenza. Um, we had a question about avian flu. We're going to get back to that and talk a little bit about influenza and why this virus is, is so successful. So let's begin by talking about West Nile. So as many of you know, in 1999, uh, this sort of index case of, of, of a new kind of viral-induced encephalitis in the US was here in the New York area. And West Nile, West Nile emerged in 1999. Where did it come from? So when something like this shows up, and initially there was some confusion about what virus this was. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, sometime after it was first isolated that people actually figured out that it was, in fact, West Nile as opposed to another relative of this virus that is found in the United States called uh, St. Louis encephalitis, and one that's found in Australia called Kunchen. Um, the virus that, that popped up in New York, the sort of closest relative of that that we've seen, is actually in Israel, an uh, isolate from a goose in Israel. Um, now the question is, well, how did how did it get here? And I have to say that we, we still don't know the answer to that question. I mean, how did this virus get introduced into the United States? Was somebody infected and on a plane? Was there a mosquito? This is a mosquito-transmitted disease. Uh, was there an infected bird uh, that was uh, either shipped or flew or was blown into the, into the area, which sort of uh, nucleated this outbreak? And then how is it spread? So I want to sort of focus a little bit on that because I think it illustrates um, a couple of things about these viruses that are difficult to control. So this is a, a picture of a mosquito that can transmit West Nile virus. And one of the reasons that this is such a successful arbovirus is that West Nile, many of these viruses actually have very restricted um, mosquito vectors that transmit them. So only a few species of mosquitoes, or even only one species of mosquito, will transmit them. And then they have a, a relatively narrow vertebrate host range where the virus can replicate to high enough levels so that if the vertebrate gets bitten by another mosquito, there's a chance of transmitting the disease. Uh, West Nile is, is pretty promiscuous. It actually replicates in a, a number of different mosquito types. And it infects a wide variety of different uh, avian species and birds. So that's one reason why it's, it's uh, been so successful in terms of spreading over the United States. So the transmission cycle of this is, is, is a relatively complex one. But the, the sort of major cycle for West Nile in nature is the infected mosquito. Now, when these mosquitoes get infected with a virus like West Nile, they're actually pretty healthy and happy. Uh, it doesn't bother them that much. The virus sort of gets taken up in a blood meal. It goes through the gut of the insect and gets transported through various tissues and ends up in the salivary gland of the insect. 
and that sets up a chronic persistent infection for the life of this mosquito so that if it bites you now, it has a chance of transmitting this virus um, in the mosquito saliva to a vertebrate host. And the main vertebrate host for West Nile are, are birds. Um, this was sort of one of the first clues as to something different going on in the West Nile outbreak was that uh, there were people were finding dead crows all over the place, dead flamingos in the park. Um, so there was something killing these birds. And that was one of the key observations that led to the identification of this virus. Now, it circulates like this in nature. And as you can imagine, there's, there's sort of more um, uh, frequent and efficient circulation of this in areas where mosquitoes are prevalent uh, during times of the year when mosquitoes uh, multiply. And um, really, the kinds of infections that we see in humans uh, or in, in um, horses and other animals are really uh, not a big part of the life cycle of this virus. They affect us, but um, in terms of actually maintaining this virus in nature, um, both horses and humans are considered dead-end hosts. So they can become infected. Uh, the virus can replicate in them, but it replicates to low levels so that the chance of a mosquito biting you and actually transmitting it from a human to a human via mosquito bite is actually relatively small. Um, as you can imagine, mosquitoes don't drink a lot of blood. So if the virus concentration is low, the chance of having an infectious particle in that blood meal goes down. So only hosts where the virus replicates quite well. And in these, these crows, for instance, this virus can replicate to levels that are a billion, 10 billion, 100 billion uh, infectious virus particles per milliliter. So pretty, pretty high concentrations. So um, this is a picture of, in, in the blue uh, counties here in New York State, this is from the Department of Public Health, are areas where there were isolations of either birds um, or human cases of West Nile in 2000. So this was initially a fairly isolated outbreak, but I mean, it, you can imagine that if we're talking about mosquitoes and birds, that this disease could spread throughout the United States, which it did. As I mentioned, this, this virus is actually quite promiscuous in terms of its mosquito vectors and the vertebrate host that it infects. So in 1999, we're shown here in the red. Uh, green, 2000, it had sort of spread along the East Coast here. Um, in 2001, spreading west. And in 2002, it's basically all over the United States, these sort of areas that don't show up very well here. These hatched areas are actually places where there were uh, human cases uh, of West Nile. Now, uh, the good news about this is that um, West Nile infection is usually subclinical. So actually about only one in 100 people that get infected with this virus actually uh, come down with signs of, of uh, infection of the brain or encephalitis. And only about one in 10 of those people actually has a fatal outcome of encephalitis. So, you know, your chances of even if you get bitten by a mosquito and infected by West Nile of dying are only about one in a thousand. But on the other hand, you know, we don't like those odds. And so it's really time to do something about this. And there are a lot of people that are working on, on antiviral treatments for West Nile, but also more importantly, vaccines against West Nile. One of the problems is that, you know, unlike smallpox, where this virus has been eradicated um, as a human disease, these kinds of viruses that exist in nature and these sort of mosquito vertebrate cycles are almost impossible to eliminate. I mean, the first thing that you can do about an arbovirus infection like this is to get rid of the mosquitoes. And this was actually the, you know, one of the hallmarks in virology was the understanding that yellow fever, which caused major epidemics here in North America and caused a big problem in terms of being able to complete the Panama Canal, the understanding that that was transmitted by mosquitoes and that you could actually eliminate the problem by getting rid of the mosquitoes. Um, unfortunately, mosquitoes are not that easy to get rid of. And uh, there are problems with resistance to insecticides. And uh, so these are diseases that, uh, or, or viruses that are not going to disappear. Uh, that we're not really going to be able to eradicate. Um, this is um, the year after, in 2003, the red states, again, are, this is only focused on 
uh, human infections. And you can see that there are only a few states uh, besides Oregon and Washington, Maine, Alaska, and Hawaii uh, that, that didn't have um, uh, infections of West Nile in 2003. In 2004, <coughs> it was more prevalent uh, in the West again, and also in Colorado and so on. But actually, this sort of map, which doesn't show up too well, of New York, uh, these are the areas where there were human cases shown in red. Uh, there were really only a handful of cases in 2004. And so, I mean, I guess the question is, you know, this, this, this was really quite widespread in the state for one or two years. You know, why have things gotten better? And there are a number of reasons for that, some of which have to do with uh, controlling mosquitoes. And others might have to do with sort of natural resistance to the virus that's generated in nature by infection from animals and so on that uh, are now immune to the virus. So, um, but this is sort of typical of these epidemics that sort of come and wax and wane, uh, often for reasons that we don't understand very well. Monkeypox is another sort of interesting example. Um, so this, the, the star of the uh, monkeypox show is shown here on this slide. Uh, I'm sure that many of you have these as pets. This is not a New York rat. Uh, this is a Gambian giant pouch rat. I had no idea how big these things were. Um, but anyway, uh, these animals, uh, as you can tell from their name, are, you know, come from Africa, from Gambia. Um, some people like to keep them as pets. <clears throat> and so um, the problem is that, uh, that they also uh, have, have made some native friends here. And this is a, a prairie dog, which is also a, a wild animal, but that, that uh, has been sort of semi-domesticated and sold in pet stores. And um, monkeypox uh, actually can be a fatal uh, human disease, uh, like smallpox used to be. It causes these rather nasty skin lesions. Um, and this is one of the less uh, graphic pictures. I figured after lunch, maybe I shouldn't go for the, the real gore. But it can cause these lesions, and it can be a problem. So this is an example of a virus, you know, which is now sort of on the, um, the, uh, the bioterror list, is something that we don't want to be uh, importing into the United States for any reason, which actually sort of snuck in with the Gambian rat. And this actually shows you a Centers for Disease Control traceback of what happened. So there was a rodent shipment um, actually, which originated in Ghana, which had uh, a whole cavalcade of animals, including the uh, Gambian rats, rope squirrels, bushtail porcupines, tree squirrels, striped mice, and dormice. I don't even know what some of these look like, I have to be honest. And then um, sort of from this sort of repository, which is, was in Texas, um, they were shipped to uh, various places. And these blue things just tell you where they were shipped to and the kinds of animals that were shipped. But the sort of key shipment here in April, um, which went to uh, Iowa and then to Illinois, was a shipment of the Gambian rats and the dormice. And actually, that ended up in Illinois in a pet store in a facility where there were a whole bunch of prairie dogs. And basically, the, it's believed that the Gambian rats, which were infected with, with monkeypox, which doesn't cause any apparent disease in these animals, then uh, managed to get these prairie dogs infected. And then uh, people bought those as pets. And um, that led to a number of human cases, which I showed you one of in the previous slide, uh, in various places like Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, uh, Kansas City, South Carolina, and, and Miami. These two last uh, shipments didn't, didn't yield any sort of human infections. But this just gives you an idea of how you know, something sort of totally unexpected can happen. And it can be sort of disseminated by um, a network that exists. These kinds of sort of networks, whether they be air travel um, or shipping uh, you know, wild animals to pet stores around the country, uh, can be very effective ways of disseminating an infectious agent. A little scary. It's going airborne. What about the flu? Colonel, would you excuse us? Certainly, sir.
Mataba is only spread through direct human contact. Now, you said that yourself, Sam. I know what I told you, but now I'm telling you we're facing a new strain. What? It spreads like the flu. Impossible. Fine. Go to the hospital, check it out yourself. Go without a mask, you'll see more clearly. You got 19 dead, you got hundreds more infected, and it's spreading like a brush fire. You gotta isolate the sick, and I mean really isolate them, Billy. We gotta get everybody else back into their houses, we gotta keep them there. We're doing that, Sam. No, we're not doing it because I just drove through 100 people. So this is a clip which basically describes the fact that this, this virus that originated uh, in Africa, which initially was, you know, not uh, aerosol transmissible, has sort of changed to become aerosol transmissible. And the analogy that they're using is, is the flu, which, as you know, can spread you know, very, very efficiently, very quickly um, through a human population. And in, in many ways, I mean, influenza um, can be considered the, the sort of king of, of human viruses. And there are a number of reasons for this. This, this is the Elvis of, of uh, human viruses. So this is an electron micrograph of a flu particle on the right. But why is this, and why do we keep having problems with flu? Well, first of all, it's, it's, very, it's a very widespread virus. It's all over the place. Uh, it replicates in multiple uh, animal reservoirs. It is an amazing virus in terms of its ability to um, mutate or alter its genetic makeup in a fairly dramatic fashion. Sort of subtle ways are called sort of ge genetic drift. More dramatic ones, which I'll show you later, are actually called genetic shift. In some cases, a variant is generated which can actually sort of jump from one species to another. It spreads easily, and it just sort of keeps on coming. Every year, we have to deal with the flu. And as, as many of you know, um, this is a, actually quite a severe problem even in a developed country like the United States, where typically between 20 and 20,000 and 50,000 people uh, die every year because of influenza infection. So one of the, one of the sort of striking uh, infectious diseases, pandemics, of, in the last century was the 1918 flu, which gives us a glimpse of what can happen. Um, so. What about influenza? I mean, it is the most common medically attended acute respiratory illness. Uh, it causes all kinds of symptoms that you know, many of you are probably familiar with if you've had the flu. Um, the annual disease burden, as I mentioned, is really you know, quite significant. Um, and there are estimates of 70 million lost work days, 38 million lost school days, and these are not fun days to be missing school. And the societal costs of flu uh, in this country are estimated in the range of $12 billion. So this is a disease that's, that's costing us a lot of life and a lot of money. So, the flu. 1918. Remember your history, Donnie. The great influenza pandemic. Circled the globe in nine months. Killed 25 million people. My father lost three brothers in that cell. So that just sort of tells you, uh, again, sort of in the context of outbreak, you know, putting the 1918 flu pandemic in perspective. And actually, you know, some of the figures quoted in that are believed to be an underestimate of how many people were actually killed in a remarkably short period uh, between 1918 and 1920. If you look at a, a plot of the life expectancy, which has continually climbed, from the early 1900s to the present day, there was this remarkable dip uh, that coincided with the flu epidemic when between 25 million and 100 million people died. Um, pretty remarkable number. If you look at, and this is a, a, a catalog of, of death notations, over that period of time uh, in, the, in the winter of 1918. And you can just see how the pandemic, you know, there are relatively uh, thin volumes on the sides. This, this should actually go out farther than this. There was sort of a peak uh, in the late fall, and then it, it dropped off. 
And this, this pandemic is something that we're really still trying to understand today. Um, unlike the typical flu epidemics that we have here that sort of either target the very young or the very old in terms of their more severe consequences and even death, uh, the 1918 pandemic was probably about 20 times more virulent than sort of the, the uh, current fir circulating fl flu strains. And actually, young adults were um, often the targets of uh, lethal infection by the 1918 flu. And it left sort of whole villages of, of people uh, sort of with the adults wiped out with uh, the children as shown here as survivors. And one of the things that scientists have done in the last several years has actually been to try and figure out what it was about the 1918 flu that made it 20 times more virulent. At least those are the current estimates. And, and they're really still trying to sort that out. But in fact, they've been able to dig up um, some of the bodies of people that died from the 1918 flu that were preserved in the Nordic permafrost and actually able to amplify short sequences of the influenza genome to actually figure out how that strain uh, compared to the ones that we have today. And there's some evidence that you know, some of the surface proteins of the 1918 flu were um, playing an important role in the increased virulence. So I guess one of the things that one has to ask themselves is, you know, how did this come about? And you know, is there a possibility that we're going to be facing you know, something like the 1918 flu pandemic again. I mean, the annual flu that we have just from the usual strains that arise is, is bad enough. So um, there's this cartoon that says the flu is coming, the flu is coming, a bunch of chickens getting worried about this. And it's made it onto the cover of Time magazine with the uh, subtitle, Is Asia Hatching, Asia Hatching the Next Human Pandemic? So let's talk a little bit about the virus, a little bit more molecular virology, not too much. Um, it's a negative sense RNA virus. Uh, it is a segmented genome. So it's got uh, eight segments. Each one of those segments encodes a different protein. The two key segments that you sort of have to keep in mind with flu are the hemagglutin and the neuraminidase, which are, again, surface proteins that are displayed on the virus particle. And the interesting thing about flu is that we were talking about sort of competition, is that flu actually has the ability with this segmented genome, if two different viruses get into a same cell, to actually form what we call a reassortment. So there can be sort of dramatic shifts in the virus properties. So this is a case where a bird virus infects a pig, a human virus infects a pig. If those two viruses end up in the same cell, they can be biologically really quite different. And then you can end up getting something which has basically a segment of the bird virus incorporated into the human virus. And this virus can have completely different sort of biological properties, you know, from the original viruses. It can, it can be different enough so that the Im immunity that you might have from infection of the flu that you got last year will not protect you against reinfection with this new virus. So it's able to really sort of shift the surface of the virus coat in a way that makes it very difficult to protect generally against, say, all emerging flu strains. So, I mean, the, the, the point of that clip is to give you an idea that viruses can mutate. Uh, they can sort of change their abilities to survive in nature, you know, possibly be communicated through the air uh, and cause disease. And uh, in this case, it's an example of a virus that wasn't aerosol transmissible becoming aerosol transmissible. In the case of flu, it's a matter of a virus maybe changing its ability to replicate in one host, be transmitted in that new host to other members of that host species. So what about uh, flu H5N1? So this is hemagglutin in type 5, neuraminidase type 1. That's the way these things are being measured. So this is the so-called bird flu, which is popping up in Asia. And uh, sort of the beginning of this story is a goose. This was first isolated in 1996 in southern China in Guangdong. Uh, 
1997, uh, this actually seemed to correlate with an outbreak of bird flu, a, a strain of flu that could actually kill domestic birds. That was a reassortment. And there was sort of a, a lot of uh, shuffling going on between geese, quail, and duck, which have various influenza uh, subtypes, to give rise to this, this bird flu, of which one third of the people that got infected with it, a very high mortality rate, died. Now, the good news about this is that uh, this can be apparently transmitted from infected poultry to humans, but it doesn't transmit very well from human to human. So that's something that we really worry about. From 1997 to 2002, the geese have been active, and uh, this has generated some new strains of H5N1 that are quite uh, similar to each other in terms of their antigenicity, their surface proteins, and also multiple genotypes. Now this particular strain that was circulating at the end of 2002 kills chickens, but it doesn't kill wild birds like ducks. So these things really differ in, differ in their virulence properties with respect to uh, different kinds of birds. Um, from then on, there's been, again, some more shuffling of, of genes by reassortment. Um, it's been isolated from wild migrating birds, which means that this is potentially sort of moving around with uh, bird migration. There's antigenic drift in the HA protein, which is the protein that sort of interacts with sialic acid on the surface of cells, which is the, the flu um, receptor. Uh, this means that there are mutations in that that uh, protein, which make it less able to be recognized by the immune system. This is now um, becoming pathogenic for aquatic birds. And then in February of 2003, uh, a family visiting Fujian, China, um, was, one of them was infected, the daughter died, and the father and son were infected, and then the father actually ended up dying from this as well. So this just shows you a little schematic diagram of, of these genome segments being passed around from this goose isolate, with that, which has red segments in 1999, to some various goose-duck uh, reassortants, uh, sort of more reassortants cropping up in nature in 2001, um, other uh, isolates from wild birds getting into the mix, 2003, and then what's emerged in 2004 sort of called the, the, the Z strain, um, which has the properties that uh, I'll describe to you in a moment. Now, as I said before, the, the thing about flu is that it, it has the ability to shift and uh, jump species. But, you know, one of the things that we worry about the most is that this avian flu, which is, which is highly lethal in humans, will actually figure out a way to become human to human transmissible. And this is one of the worries that we have. And one of the sort of melting pots for this, as you saw in the earlier cartoon, is the pig, where often, uh, you know, sort of incubation of these potential pandemic strains in the pigs lead to isolates that are more easily transmitted to humans and potentially more uh, easily transmitted from uh, human to human. And in fact, uh, the H5N1 uh, avian flu has been isolated from pigs. And actually, um, you know, there's evidence that flu can replicate in not just pigs and birds, uh, but also some of the big cats and also uh, domestic cats as well, which is a little bit, uh, little bit scary. So, you know, how pathogenic is this sort of avian flu that has been um, popping up sporadically? Uh, it's pretty pathogenic. It kills a chicken in less than one day. It kills ducks in one to two days. There's a high risk of death uh, in humans, um, sort of in the uh, age range that uh, some of you guys are in. Uh, it causes diarrhea, respiratory symptoms. And uh, this is just a summary of the recent cases of bird flu in Vietnam, where there have been uh, 10 cases an average of 14 uh, years old of these patients that were not 
sick from any other sort of known medical condition, high fever, uh, lymphopenia, diarrhea, and basically 70% mortality. So this is, a, this is a pretty scary bug. This is, this is more lethal than smallpox. It's more lethal than uh, Ebola, um, typically. So uh, it's definitely something that, that uh, we should be a little bit concerned about. Now, one of the problems is that, uh, you know, some of these new potential pandemic strains are just generated by um, basically aggregating all of these permissive animal species that the viruses can replicate. And this is just a picture of a market um, in Hong Kong where you can see, uh, you know, ducks. And let's see, what do we, we got chickens. I think there's some quail in here somewhere as well. And so one of the things that we can do to sort of prevent the generation of these things is to you know, change the way that uh, poultry marketing is done in some of these cities. So in 1998, um, with the sort of after the first emergence of, of bird flu in Hong Kong, uh, they got basically rid of all of the uh, of the poultry in the market. And then in, in 2001, they instituted a clean day a, a month, where they basically cleaned everything out. Um, in 2001, they got rid of quail, which are also a, a sort of an intermediate host that seems to be kind of like pigs in terms of a good incubator for, for making uh, reassortants that may be human infectious. And then in 2002, they actually implemented um, vaccination uh, of, of birds in affected farms um, and a sort of ring vaccination. So if there was an outbreak, they would sort of vaccinate around that. And then in 2003, they've actually uh, instituted using the vaccine um, on all farms, and obviously keeping a very close eye on that. And that's really has sort of eliminated um, any new uh, uh, isolations of H5N1 from this particular area. So, um, you know, there are a number of things that we can think about in terms of controlling flu, and I'm not, we'll, we'll go into this a little bit more later in, in the context of other things that we're going to talk about. Um, there are more modern ways to make flu vaccines that are being explored, and we'll talk a bit about that. Um, clinical trials, obviously, you need the test yeast in people to make sure that they work. This is a drug, Oseltamir, which is able to, it's an antiviral drug that inhibits influenza. So that could be helpful in terms of a prophylactic treatment in people that are in an area where there's an outbreak. And then, as we've seen in the last year, we've ended up with a pretty dramatic shortage of influenza vaccines in the U.S. due to the failure of 50 million vaccine doses to, to make it from a manufacturing facility in the U.K. And so this is an area where I think public health in the United States really needs to sort of take charge and make sure that these vaccines are made, they're made correctly, and they're made um, in sufficient numbers for the people that need them. The other thing is that, you know, if you think about this in terms of the environment, um, you know, there are things that we can do to sort of discourage situations like the Hong Kong poultry market um, where these kinds of resources, these incubators can be generated. And this is a slide that I got from Rob Webster, who's really one of the world's experts in influenza. And it basically shows a feedlot operation in Iowa where they have these huge buildings that are blown up down here, um, housing millions of chickens adjacent to, you know, thousands or hundreds, tens of thousands of pigs in the same geographical area. So this is a, a situation where, you know, agribusiness and public health officials are really not sort of doing smart things because, you know, we're basically putting in these, the hosts that may help to generate the next flu pandemic right next to each other in a very, very intense, highly concentrated, high-density population. Okay. So why doesn't every virus kill us? Um, well, first of all, and we touched on this in the sort of question and answer period this morning, is that, you know, some viruses just don't infect us. They don't replicate in our cells, so it's not a problem. And in fact, most viruses fall into that category. Um, the other thing is that uh, individuals are different. Um, there are, as we also talked about this morning, there are probably uh, genes or polymorphisms in genes that we have that make us more or less susceptible to, to virus infection. 
Um, the other thing is that viruses, there can actually be variants that, that vary quite dramatically in their ability to cause disease. And we'll talk more about that later. And then, of course, you know, the, the real sort of central player in our ability to deal with viruses is the immune system. And it's really sort of the goal of, of vaccine strategies to understand what it is about the immune system that protects people from virus infection. In other words, if you um, are infected with a virus, like West Nile, for instance, if you survive the infection, um, that leaves your immune system in a way that you are protected from West Nile infection for the rest of your life. The same is true for yellow fever and, and many other viruses. Not true for influenza, which is what makes that such a special and difficult problem. So, you know, one of the questions we have is, you know, what are the immune responses that a normal virus infection can provoke that lead to immunity? So, I mean, just to give you an example of you know, and a, where a certain virus can have a dramatic spectrum in the kinds of diseases it causes. This, again, is one of our, our current uh, focuses in the lab is hepatitis C. And so this is a virus that is, as I, as I mentioned, quite widespread. Uh, the acute infection with hepatitis C is asymptomatic in most cases, so you wouldn't even know you'd been infected. Um, and the amazing thing about this virus is that about 70% of the people that are infected actually can't clear the virus. So they become chronically infected. And of these people that are chronically infected, there can be people that live for 50 years with no symptoms, no clinical symptoms of disease. They're fine. And there can be other people that progress to uh, chronic liver inflammation, uh, cirrhosis, which is shown here with these sort of scarring and nodules in the liver, to uh, liver cancer. And uh, we really don't know what it is about the host, in this case, that determines whether or not you're going to be, you know, essentially asymptomatic here, or you're going to be progressing to these more severe uh, end-stage liver diseases that sometimes require liver transplantation or they can be fatal. Uh, from the virus side of things, I mean, there are many examples in the virus literature um, where subtle differences or dramatic differences in the viral genome can have dramatic effects on pathogenesis. One of my favorites uh, is, is yellow fever. This was the first virus that was shown to cause a human disease back in the 1900. It's actually the first virus that was shown to be transmissible by mosquitoes. And it was also the first virus that in 1935, scientist Max Tyler, who won the Nobel Prize for this, derived a vaccine for this virus called the 17D vaccine. And he did that by taking the virus out of its natural mosquito vertebrate life cycle, passaging it in tissue culture, and deriving an isolate that was now no longer pathogenic in humans. One shot with this 17D vaccine strain protects you for life, we believe, against all wild strains of yellow fever. It's a pretty amazing vaccine. There are only uh, 30... Uh, one, amino acid differences that separate the ACB isolate, which is the original human isolate that will kill monkeys, to this one that will immunize them. Uh, pretty amazing. Another example is the virus variola major that causes smallpox and vaccinia. I mean, these are, if you looked at these two viruses, they look exactly the same in terms of the virion morphology, um, probably growth in cell culture and other things, but there are certainly genes that are different uh, and mutations that are different in these that makes the difference between smallpox and the virus that is used to vaccinate against smallpox. Pretty dramatic difference. Another example is the uh, polio virus, Sabin oral vaccine, which is a mixture of three attenuated uh, polio virus serotypes. And measles, the sort of wild type Edmondson strain versus the Moratin strain, which is used in the, in the measles vaccine. And another example which you may uh, have heard about is the different isolates of Ebola. So outbreak was sort of based on uh, a, a, a true story where the Zaire isolate of Ebola is actually a very highly pathogenic virus. And there was a, an ex a case where a, an infected primate was shipped to the U.S. Uh, and actually... Uh, infected other primates that died from this disease, and that from that, they isolated Ebola restin. Uh, 
which was actually had the potential of causing an outbreak like the one that you've seen on film, but it didn't. And in fact, there were several uh, human infections with this virus, and apparently it's just not nearly as pathogenic uh, as the Zaire strain. So what about protection? Back to outbreak. So this is a case where they've isolated the monkey that... Colonel, I got it. ...infected with the virus. Your helmet. Come on, come on. Got the serum from this animal to try and... Uh, okay, you ready? ...protect Dustin Hoffman's ex-wife. So now. He's been infected with... I got it, I got it. ...a tumor. You got the lab geared up. Yes, sir. Make more, we got a town waiting. It's gonna work, sir. So this is an example of one of the oldest and sort of classic ways of protecting people against virus infection. It's called passive protection, where you take serum from an infected individual who has, uh, has successfully survived the infection and put it into somebody who's infected. And basically, there are soluble factors there, uh, which are called antibodies, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, which can bind to the virus and actually neutralize infectivity. So let's talk a little bit about the immune system. So the immune system is this amazingly complex um, defense system that all mammals and, and many vertebrates have, um, which basically recognizes um, foreign invaders like viruses. And those are recognized um, by a very complex set of interactions that I don't have time to go into today, but basically they, they give rise to two kinds of two arms of the immune response, one of which the humoral response is one that generates antibody molecules that can specifically recognize um, proteins or other components of, of these invaders. The other side of the equation, um, the cell-mediated immune response is what I talked to you earlier about. Those are cells that are educated by the immune system that are capable of recognizing, for instance, a virus-infected cell and then killing it. So this is an example of, again, our, our friend the cold virus, human rhinovirus 14, and some work by Tom Smith, uh, where he's actually been studying the mechanism by which antibodies neutralize viruses. And so this is what human rhinovirus uh, 14 looks like. This is an antibody uh, shown here. Uh, an image of an antibody, and basically antibodies have two arms, so they're bivalent. Each one of those can, can bind to a determinant uh, on the virus surface, and this is an example of human rhinovirus 14 that has just been coated with these antibody molecules. So you can imagine how these work. They just sort of bind to these cell surface projections that I told you about earlier that are required for the virus to bind to and enter cells, and if those are blocked, then the virus is out of luck. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. In terms of the, the, the um, cytotoxic cells, the ones that kill virus-infected cells, this is an example of a cytotoxic T cell. These cells actually have receptors on their surface which have been educated to recognize just sort of fragments of viral proteins that are displayed on the surface of infected cells. So for instance, this interaction here which is specific to this T cell, leads to its recognition and secretion of various things that poke holes, for instance, in the cell membrane and lead to the lysis of the cell, which then cuts down on the ability of the virus to produce progeny. Cells which don't express these viral antigens are, are uh, pretty much safe. So, I mean, I think vaccines are one of the uh, examples of, you know, some of the greatest triumphs in virology uh, in the last... Uh, several hundred years in microbiology. This is, this is a picture of uh, sort of getting uh, cowpox, uh, which is believed to be the origin of the smallpox vaccine uh, from, the, from the time of, of Jenner. Uh, this was a, uh, a method of vaccination that goes back centuries. Uh, of course, it's now modernized. And of course, people are getting more interested in this now again in terms of vaccinating against smallpox. And this is kind of a a sad note is because, you know, this is now considered a potential, you know, bioterrorist agent, and it is certainly uh, a little bit disheartening that we're spending a lot of our time sort of stockpiling uh, or making new vaccines for things that we've already eradicated. But anyway, that's, that's the way things are. So this is a, a picture that shows a, a mummy which had evidence of 
of smallpox. You saw this earlier, Ramses the fifth. Um, earliest known victim, at least in terms of, you know, this is a very ancient disease that is now gone, we hope. And there have been many other successes on the vaccine front. Uh, we now have vaccines for hepatitis A and B. Um, we now, which you have had, uh, measles, mumps, and rubella. This is sort of the triple whammy that you get as a, as a child. Um, polio, uh, we're well on our way to eradicating polio. This is a virus which uh, is exclusively a human virus, so we really have a chance of, of getting rid of it. But if you've been reading the newspapers, we have been having some problems containing it in certain regions of, of Africa lately. Um, rabies, uh, this was uh, the first vaccine that was developed by Louis Pasteur. Um, we have quite an effective vaccine for that. A uh, vaccine for uh, chicken pox and yellow fever, which I just described to you. And as I mentioned sort of at the outset, I guess one of the, the things that uh, we're quite excited about is this vaccine for a human papillomavirus that is associated with the development of cervical cancer. Uh, so this may, in fact, uh, be the sort of first, if you will, anti-cancer vaccine by a cancer which is precipitated by infection with the human virus. Uh, that said, um, we've got a lot of challenges. Um, HIV has continued to elude efforts to produce an effective vaccine, although there's a great deal of effort uh, moving in that direction. Dengue is another uh, virus in the same family as yellow fever in West Nile. Uh, it infects hundreds of millions of people every year. Uh, some of those infections result in uh, a severe hemorrhagic disease and shock and death particularly in Asia, it's a big problem. Um, there are four different serotypes of dengue circulating and it's generally believed that any kind of vaccine that we need to have for dengue needs to immunize simultaneously against all four of those because in the case of dengue, if you get infected with one and resolve that, it doesn't protect you against the other three serotypes and in fact, it may even increase your chances of getting a more severe uh, disease when you're infected with one of the other serotypes. And there are many more viruses that uh, you can imagine. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about um, flu vaccines because I think that's something that's kind of on everybody's mind. So the way that flu vaccines are made today are to sort of guess at what the emerging viruses are going to be in the next season, um, make them by one reason, one, one sort or another by making sort of reassortants in cell culture growing these things up in embryonated chicken eggs, basically gouging up these eggs after the virus has grown, spinning out the crud, and uh, using that as the vaccine. Um, it's recommended uh, in, in very young uh, children and older people. Um, the sort of drift in the circulating strains requires that you sort of get this every year. It's an IM uh, vaccination. It costs about 15 bucks a dose. There are about 100 million doses sold annually in the U.S., although not this year. Uh, but there are still 150 million people that are not vaccinating, vaccinated, including a number of, of people that should be vaccinated. Now, there have been a number of efforts to sort of modernize this. And one of them is kind of an interesting story. And this is the, the newer way where actually you can make a live attenuated virus. And live attenuated virus vaccines like the yellow fever vaccine actually elicit a much better immune response that's longer lived and, and better for protection. And so that's when they're, and they're generally easier to produce as well. So basically, and this was done in the, in the mid 60s, um, an investigator in, in, uh, in the Chicago area derived an attenuated uh, flu strain, which we call the master strain. This was a cold adapted uh, flu strain from tissue culture that is temperature sensitive and a virulent. And basically, these are the two proteins that we worry about in terms of vaccines. And basically, this is used as the master strain for making new reassortants that then have the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase genes from new flu strains that are circulating that you want to vaccinate against. And so this is the reassortant. And so these strains can be um, grown in cell culture. And uh, as I'll show you in a moment, they can actually be administered in ways that don't the, require the use of needles, uh, which could be an advantage in, under some circumstances. Yet another way is that um, we actually, through the efforts of a number of labs, including uh, Adolfo Garcia Sastre, who's 
uh, at Mount Sinai um, and others, we now have the ability to actually engineer these flu strains via recombinant DNA. So the different flu segments can actually be propagated as plasmid DNAs in E. coli, and we can use those plasmid DNAs when they're co-transfected into a susceptible cell to derive uh, a new uh, strain of influenza virus with which whatever gene segments we want to have. So that's a more modern way of doing it. I guess one of the things I wanted to point out is that at least in the case of this cold adapted master strain strategy, um, which was started uh, here in 1967 in a paper reported by John Massab, it's taken it until 2003 for this to sort of move through clinical development and uh, to licensure. Uh, so we had quite a few presidents during that time. Um, almost, you know, 35 years that it took to sort of get this into people for the first time. And making vaccines is pretty expensive. So the estimates to sort of take this through the development stages, uh, through clinical trials, estimates are up to $150 million. So developing vaccines is generally not cheap. And of course, vaccine developers, you know, face some other things that we might want to talk about. And that is, well, okay, not all vaccines are 100% effective. And not all vaccines are completely without side effects. And so this is a big issue. You know, if you spend a lot of money developing a vaccine and, you know, one out of 100 million people has a bad side effect and somebody sues you for $150 million, then it's not so good. It's not a very strong incentive for the people developing these. So these are important issues in terms of vaccine development. So anyway, you get the idea. Um, I mean, the big mistake that was made with that vaccine was that sort of in designing their clinical trials, they actually didn't manage to get it approved in the sort of more extreme age groups where you'd want to use flu, the sort of very young and the, and the over 50. And then uh, sort of when they launched the product, they, they charged about three times as much as the, uh, as the other flu vaccine. So even though it may be sort of as effective and more convenient, uh, it wasn't a smashing success. On the other hand, if they'd had 50 million doses of this on hand this year when the other vaccine sort of bit the dust because of regulatory problems, uh, it probably would have been a huge success. But sometimes timing is everything. So anyway, um, on to sort of antivirals. These are the other kinds of ways that we combat viruses. Um, and so what, what do you need to know about antivirals? So first of all, um, as I said before, the preference in antivirals, and, and this is an advantage of, of, of viruses, is, is to you're targeting a virus-specific process. So in terms of actually coming up with, say, cancer therapy, where you're trying to sort of interfere with cellular machinery to, say, kill or stop a cancer cell from dividing, viruses do have sort of unique features that you can target with the hope of not interfering with the host. Um, and that should have the result of minimizing side effects. So if you're targeting the virus and not the host, it's good. The problem is something that I sort of pointed out in, in replication of hepatitis C, where you're generating 10 to the 20th variants a day. I mean, some of these drugs can be made to be highly specific, but there are also examples where a virus with only a single amino acid substitution is now resistant to that antiviral compound. It's no longer inhibited by it. So viral resistance is a, is a big problem. And drug development is also a pretty, uh, pretty difficult process. So, I mean, this just gives you some highlights of, of the various steps that are involved in, in drug discovery. So if you have a viral enzyme that you're targeting, the size of these dots is, is meant to sort of represent the attrition of the number of compounds that you start with. And basically, if you screen a million compounds to try and find some that will inhibit this enzyme, you end up with a reasonable number that will. Uh, then you do a secondary screen that's usually cell-based to see if those compounds will actually get into the cell. You look at efficacy to see if it'll inhibit virus replication. Most of these guys don't, don't cut it, so they drop out. Then there are whole problems when you start taking these cells out of cell culture and putting them into animals. You know, where do they go? Do they get excreted too quickly? Do they even go to the right organ? Uh, are they toxic? Uh, a number of them drop out there, and then they get into clinical trials in humans, and there are always still some surprises. Things that sort of get through these stages here 
often fail in clinical trials, or they might show early efficacy in clinical trials, and then when you expand it to a larger number of people or longer treatments, um, they fail. So at the end of the day, sort of starting with you know, millions of compounds, you're lucky at the end of the day with a lot of biology and, and medicinal chemistry to come out with one at the end of the day that makes it as a drug. So it's a very challenging process. I guess estimates, this process probably takes close to you know, half a billion to a billion dollars. Um, it's a lot of money. So, but progress has been made, and I thought I'd just illustrate, you know, some of the ideas, you know, conceptual ideas in terms of drug development, again, using our, our old friend, um, HIV. So HIV, as, as I mentioned before, is an RNA virus that goes through a DNA intermediate that integrates in the cell. It has a number of sort of key genes. Uh, these are the sort of CAPSA genes, or GAG the polymerase genes and the envelope genes that are involved in getting it, and then a whole bunch of different accessory genes that play various roles in the virus life cycle. These are sort of all potential um, targets for anti-HIV uh, inhibitors. And the ones that are currently in the most widespread use are inhibitors of a viral protease that is responsible for cleaving up some of these proteins that's necessary for infectivity of released virus or reverse transcriptase inhibitors that inhibit this enzyme that uh, David Baltimore and Howard Temin discovered earlier on, but HIV has also one of these enzymes. That will inhibit the conversion of the RNA to DNA and sort of it will block all subsequent uh, downstream steps. And if you combine these two, you can get a very efficient suppression of HIV replication. So this is an example of combining these two, sort of looking at the loss of circulating virus in an HIV-infected patient over time. You can see it drops down to the limit of detection. And with a competent, concomitant increase in the number of CD4 cells, the cells that HIV either directly or indirectly kills, and which are responsible for uh, the sort of low CD4 counts are responsible for the immunodeficiency that's seen in the end stages of this disease. And, you know, the institution of what we call heart or highly active antiretroviral therapy has had a dramatic impact on diminishing deaths related to persistent HCV infection uh, in the U.S. since the institution of this therapy in the uh, mid to late 90s. So you can see the increase in therapy, the decrease in deaths. So it's really been quite a remarkable success story. There are a number of other uh, inhibitors that are being explored, inhibitors that will block uh, the entry of the virus into cells, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment, um, as well as inhibitors that inhibit the integration of the viral genome into the host cell DNA, and also inhibitors that block the ability of these proteins to be assembled and released into, uh, into virus particles. So there are a lot of different steps. Basically, every step in the virus life cycle is a potential target. So here's an example of an uh, inhibitor of the entry process. So I'm going to just replay this movie that you've seen already in terms of HIV entry. And basically what people recognized was that the conformational changes that are required in order to bind the receptor, engage the co-receptor, and bring the viral membrane and the cellular membrane together for fusion um, require all these dramatic structural changes in the proteins, including the formation of these two helical segments that bring the membranes together. So the idea became that if you could actually make something that binds to this and inhibits the ability of this reorganized helix to interact with it, you would basically block this um, fusion event shown here. And remarkably enough, this strategy actually works. And uh, this is done with a synthetic peptide, a uh, short um, protein sequence that mimics that. And this is an example of how that works. It's called the T20 peptide. OK, everything's starting off. The virus says, OK, lunch is served. Nice looking cell good receptor, everything's looking good. Here we go. So it attaches to CD4, 
engages the co-receptor, causes a conformational change, liberating this thing. Uh-oh, here come the peptides, sort of binding to that region, coiling up there, and then they basically sort of block the ability of the, of the HCV glycoprotein to mediate that effect. So pretty cool. So I mean, this is an example where trying to sort of understand these things can actually uh, <laughs> lead, to, uh, lead to something useful. Now, you know, something I wanted to say about HIV is the development of these antiretroviral drugs, which you can show down here, see down here in the sort of little blip, uh, as I showed you earlier, has had a pretty dramatic effect on the decline of HIV-related deaths in developing in developed countries. But if you look in developing countries, basically this curve is just going up and up and up. And so we, set, we face a very severe problem in terms of getting these kinds of treatments or even vaccines to people that really need them in developing countries. And this, this remains one of the sort of major issues in public health. Sort of became apparent to me sort of early on in my days when we were studying yellow fever and this vaccine strain for yellow fever, the 17D strain. This was developed in 1935. As I told you, I mean, it has almost 100% efficacy and it has very few side effects. And yet there are people dying of yellow fever in epidemics in Brazil and in Africa. And the problem is that even once we have these drugs and we have these vaccines, there's still a whole nother layer of being able to make them and get them distributed. It's a sort of socioeconomic matter in the countries that really need them. And this is something that we're really going to have to sort of come to grips with in the future. And as many of you know, you know some of the pharmaceutical companies are now uh, either donating drugs uh, to some of these countries in Africa to, to help sort of slow uh, AIDS progression in those countries, or providing a means for countries themselves to sort of manufacture their own drugs. So, I mean, these are very important public health issues that we need to come to grips with. What about the T virus? Uh -oh. The T virus was a major more virus war. breakthrough, although it clearly also possessed highly. So, I guess, you know, people think of viruses as pretty bad. And this just sort of. We knew of, about the uh, Taba all along. The 1101 was the anti serum. Yeah. And not only are they you bad in terms of causing disease, they're sort of. But you did bad for potential nefarious uses we, by humans. We, this is also we, dealt with in outbreak where no, I want the host. You got to tell me what the host is. That, you know, maybe host. this virus was something we had to that synthesize was the contemplated sure, as a bio to protect the troops. Uh, but now the virus comes here and two kids die, and we could have stopped it right then and there. But we don't because we have to protect the perfect biological weapon. But then the virus mutates, and we can't stop it now. And we could have then. Get us in the air. Should we contact the command center? Let them know we have the antiserum? They don't care. They want to bury the town. Oh, this is crazy. They want their weapon. They're going to kill all those people. Right. They want their They're weapon. They're going to sit there and watch all those innocent people die? Yes, they want their weapon. All right. So everybody thinks viruses are bad. Well, some viruses are bad, but I, I wanted to sort of end up with some things that I think are you know, pretty remarkable in terms of uh, good news about viruses. You know, can there be any good news about viruses? And just tell you sort of a few things that I think are, are worth considering because we sort of think about these, these guys as, as entities that we want to get rid of. Virologists sort of think about that, you know, yeah, we want to get rid of these, we want to control them, but we also want to use them for things that are interesting to do. So, I mean, one of the things that you can use uh, viruses for are, as I've showed you, these viruses are able to replicate in a diverse variety of host cell types. They can be amazingly efficient machines for making biomolecules. So, for instance, you can basically engineer some of these viruses to produce molecules, proteins, that will be useful as biotherapeutics. I don't have an example to show you of that today, but that kind of work is already going on. So anyway, the good news about viruses, yeah, most viruses don't cause disease. And there are examples where we can actually use viruses to fight uh, other viruses. And I've given you a number of different examples of that, which have to do with either killed vaccines or live attenuated vaccine viruses. I'll give you sort of one, one more example of that, sort of going back to, to one of my old favorites, the yellow fever 
uh, vaccine strain 17D. And this is a, a schematic of the genome of the virus, which basically encodes one long open reading frame, one long protein, which is basically chopped into the virion structural components or the non-structural components. And basically, with recombinant DNA technology, and this is work that, that we began and that uh, um, Tom Monath at a canvas is doing, you can replace the envelope proteins of the yellow fever 17D strain with some of these other flaviviruses like Japanese encephalitis, dengue, and West Nile, and make chimeric viruses that are capable of replicating in cell culture. And they're actually, they can be designed so that they're attenuated. And people are actually exploring these chimeric yellow fever, um, dengue, and Japanese encephalitis, and West Nile as vaccines for those diseases. They've been shown to grow well in culture. They have been shown to um, be safe uh, in terms of primate neurovirulence tests. They elicit protective immunity against virus infection. So this is an example where a virus that started off bad, causing epidemics of yellow fever, was attenuated by man and cell culture. We basically converted it into recombinant DNA so that we could engineer it. And now it's serving as a backbone to produce potentially other, other human vaccine viruses. Another example which sort of strikes close to home is, is using viruses to fight bacteria. And this, this goes back to a very early observation in the early 1900s or maybe even before, you know, when people noticed that there were bacteriophages that could bind to and lyse bacteria. People thought about using them as, as ways of combating microbial infections. And this idea has come back uh, recently with, uh, with Vince Fischetti's work here at Rockefeller University in something that is termed phage enzyme therapy. Now, as I mentioned, some of these phages actually get out of cells by producing a protein called phage lysin that pokes holes in the bacterial membrane. And some of the things that you need to know about this is that specific phage prey on specific bacteria, just like some of the viruses that we talk about use specific receptors and so on to get in. The phage produce these enzymes that are highly specific for these different bacterial hosts. And they're actually easy to make, either by purifying them from sort of phage-infected bacteria or using recombinant DNA techniques. They're, these enzymes, you can put them on. They're highly specific, so they lyse only the bacteria that they're targeted to lyse. They're very effective at uh, killing these bacteria. And what Vince has been interested in using these for are both for diagnostics, because you can have a panel of these lysins. You can just sort of put them on a bacterium and then find out which one it is by virtue of which one gets sliced, or possibly for therapy. In other words, um, basically using this as a way of lysing a specific bacteria. And this is an example where they've purified the enzyme from a bacteriophage that infects uh, the bacterium anthrax, and then basically dump this into a culture of anthrax. And you can basically see what happens to this over a matter of minutes. The, the, so the phage lysin, of course, you can't see that. Those rod-like structures of the anthrax bacillus, it just blows them away. Pretty amazing. So, you know, this is a possible way of actually getting rid of anthrax. Pretty effective. Um, another thing that viruses can be used for is for um, fighting genetic diseases. These guys, as I mentioned before, are they package these very ornate and elaborate particles to allow them to get into cells, and we can basically exploit that packaging machinery for delivering things into cells. So an example of this is in gene therapy, and there are a couple of examples of viruses that are being used for that, um, relatives of HIV, uh, so retroviruses that can actually integrate into the host genome are being used to sort of transmit genomes that are stably integrated. Uh, adenoviruses, such as those shown here, uh, basically these are recombinant adenoviruses that would have the human therapeutic gene of interest that could get in and uh, express that gene. And then adeno-associated viruses, a little tiny virus, uh, is also turning out to be quite a good gene therapy vector. There are a lot of issues associated with this technology. It's still um, very early on, but I think it still certainly has a promise and is work in, worth investigating. Here's something that you probably haven't heard about, the idea of actually using viruses to fight cancer. 
Um, we usually think about viruses as the disease problem rather than the solution. But actually, it turns out, again, since viruses like particular kinds of cells or they can be engineered to infect particular kinds of cells, um, they can be used potentially to combat therapies. And they basically can help to get rid of tumors by two kinds of mechanisms. One is by actually infecting tumor cells and, and basically leading to their destruction. Or the other sort of an indirect mechanism by infecting tumor cells and then actually enhancing the immune response against those tumor cells. And uh, this would be a therapy which is completely different than the kind of chemotherapy, radiation therapy that uh, is in common use today. So the idea is that you know, somebody with a tumor gets injected with what we call an oncolytic virus, something that's not oncogenic, but oncolytic. It can infect uh, tumor cells. Uh, the virus gets into the tumor cells, basically selectively replicates in the tumor cells, and leads to tumor reduction, either through, as I mentioned, cytotoxic mechanisms or immune mechanisms. Now, this probably sounds pretty far-fetched. Um, and I have to admit, I thought it was pretty far-fetched, too. But nonetheless, people have persisted. And there are examples of Rio virus, Newcastle disease virus, measles, adenovirus, herpes simplex, and vaccinia virus that are actually in clinical trials now. Uh, for use against a variety of different cancers that range from skin cancer, melanoma, to an untreatable kind of, of brain cancer, glioblastoma, prostate cancer, um, a variety of different cancers. So we'll be sort of keeping an, our eye on these clinical trials to see how they work. Although, for instance, this herpes simplex therapy actually looks uh, quite promising for people that would have died of this kind of disease in a matter of months surviving for, for years uh, after treatment. So we'll have to see how that pans out. So some of the other things that are pretty amazing about viruses, just some, some facts. They are uh, sort of masters of the globe, if you will. Um, if you didn't know it, there are approaching 10 billion viruses per liter of seawater. So when you go swimming in the ocean, you're sort of taking a, bath, a virus bath. Um, as, as sort of circulating at that concentration in seawater, they influence many, many biological processes, ecological processes, like nutrient recycling, respiration, bacterial and algal biodiversity. Uh, they can facilitate genetic transfer. And it's estimated by uh, people like uh, Curtis Suttle, who studies this, that between 5 and 30 percent of the carbon uh, the carbon recycling that goes on to sort of keep our environment functioning goes through a viral shunt. So, you know, in other words, viruses are sort of lysing cells and recycling things. So if you uh, didn't have viruses, we'd probably be in, in real trouble here. Now, I wanted to sort of close by giving you some examples of really some wild stuff. Um, so extreme viruses. Now, what are extreme viruses? This sort of got at sort of a question that was asked earlier about viruses in space, you know. Um, basically, everywhere there's life, there are viruses, pretty much. Um, and uh, so the story of extreme viruses, at least the one that I'm going to tell you a little bit about today, sort of begins in this. Does everybody know what this is? This is actually a sort of volcanic hot spring in Yellowstone National Park. And uh, sort of the, the, uh, the sort of history behind this is by a displaced virologist called Mark Young, who, uh, whose wife moved to Bozeman, Montana, and said he was actually a faculty member at Purdue University and said, well, you're going to have to move to Bozeman uh, if you want to stay with me. So he moved to Bozeman, sort of this errant virologist there. And um, he got to thinking about, well, what could he do and in Wyoming, you know, that would be really unique. So he decided he was going to go look for viruses in the Yellowstone Hot Springs. Mark was also a, a forest ranger in his sort of prior career before he became a virologist. So this made a lot of sense because he could spend his time hiking around Yellowstone National Park looking for viruses. You know, and so these viruses that, that he's found are, are, are pretty interesting. And they basically tell us that viruses can replicate in the most extreme environments because these hot springs are basically close to sort of boiling temperatures. The water pH is like acetic acid, pH 3. 
there are microorganisms that thrive in this, including a number of bacteria. Um, and one of the ones that they focused a lot of attention on is this one called Sophilobus, uh, which you know is sort of cooking around in these hot springs. And here you can see another hot spring backpack, you know, just sort of hanging out there, checking out the hot spring. These things are, as you might guess, not that easy to work with in the laboratory. I mean, how do you just sort of, how do you grow something that, you know, likes being at 90 degrees centigrade? Your sort of conventional Petri plates don't work too well at that because, you know, everything is sort of a melted soup. Um, so they're not that easy. But they have basically found a whole variety of viruses that prey on these bacteria that exist in in these hot springs from Iceland, Japan, from Yellowstone National Park. Um, I mean, just look at the shapes and sizes of these things. They're really wild. And they have determined genome sequences for many of these viruses. There are genes in here that have no relationship to anything that we've seen before in human or animal viruses out of this world. Not surprisingly, this work, uh, part of Mark's work, is actually being funded by NASA because they're sort of looking at this as a way of exploring for other forms of life that they might find on other planets. Um, so it sort of comes back to an earlier question. Now, one of the other things that Mark has been doing, he's a structural biologist who likes to sort of look at the structure of these viruses. Is he got to thinking that, well, maybe these viruses, you know, with these sort of bizarre and regular structures would be useful for material science and, and nanotechnology. So nanotechnology is this this new buzzword where people are making things that do interesting things that are really tiny, tiny, you know, very small. Viruses are small, as I hope I've convinced you in most cases, and they can have these very regular icosahedral structures that are, you know, sort of defined. You can actually control these by making mutations. You can sort of change the geometry of them. They are metastable. You can take them apart. You can put them together. And of course, they package a, a charged polymer, RNA or DNA. So the idea is that you could use these protein shells as a way of making nano assemblies of different kinds of materials for different applications. And there are a variety of these different protein shells that I've shown you before. You've seen this guy on the left, these different icosahedral structures. And basically what uh, Mark and his group uh, his collaborators have done is to sort of take these virus shells and either assemble them without nucleic acid or remove the nucleic acid, and then you're ended up with an empty virion shell. You can diffuse um, molecules in these, like in this case tungstate, in the presence of acid, and it'll actually form a deposit that, that nucleates on the inside of this virus particle so that you get basically a mineralized virion particle that you can then chew off the protein on the outside and then you've just created an entity, which is this material that has been mimicking the inside surface of this virus particle. And these guys are using this kind of technology for just a variety of different things. Um, they are making these kinds of nanomaterials that have different catalytic properties. Uh, you can basically design them at will. They're much more regular than the kinds of, of, of micro assemblies or nano assemblies that you can make. You can make them magnetic. You can make them to have different kinds of optical properties. Uh, they're even exploring the ability of these things to actually store digital information. Um, so a wide variety of things. In terms of biology, this is really a, a potentially cool uh, sort of application where they basically are able to modify the surface of the viral protein shell with three amino acids, RGD, which actually target these particles to binding to a, a, a deposited molecule or a molecule expressed on some cell surfaces called integrin. So you can actually modify the surface so that this particle would be targeted to specific cell types. And then you can also figure out ways, as I've showed you, to encapsulate different things in them, like drugs, slow release kinds of things. So there really are you know, some pretty creative uses that you can put these viral cages to. So I, I want to sort of end on that note. I mean, we've, we've heard about sort of the, the fact that viruses cause disease, and that's why we don't like them, and we want to sort of get rid of them and control them. But on the other hand, you know, viruses are pretty important. They are sort of global bioregulators, uh, sometimes good ones, sometimes bad ones. Um, they can be useful in biomedicine uh, as vaccines. Uh, they're here to stay. We're not going to get rid of them. 
So um, we need to sort of learn to live with them uh, in ways that uh, suit our purposes. And I guess one of the things that's always fascinated me about viruses is that the study of these viruses really reveals the mysteries of life. Many of the great biological discoveries in science and biomedicine have been made um, in the context of studying viruses. And so as you study these viruses, um, you just never know what you're going to find out about biology. It's just a fantastic uh, thing. So let me, uh, I'm not going to go through all these acknowledgments here, but a lot of slides. Thank you. And uh, certainly a, a huge thanks to you, the audience. You've been great and, and uh, very, very patient. And uh, and uh, last but not least, I'd like to uh, thank some of the folks here that helped here. This is Lynn Love sitting right down here in the front. Kathy Yarborough, who's sort of the head of uh, public relations here. Amanda and Mike, who uh, helped put this presentation together. All those gory clips. They're the ones. And uh, this is my dog, Wrangler, who is an accomplished virus catcher. Here. So I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions if people are still uh, hanging in there. But, uh... OK. Dead cells back, viruses can bring dead cells back to life. It was in, uh, I think, December, uh, November's issue of Scientific American. Wow. That's a good one. I'm not aware of, uh, I guess it sort of depends on how you classify a dead cell. Dead cell, they meant virus, no DNA, destroyed DNA. But they said that virus, uh, like, with the, the DNA, the virus DNA inside the surface of the cell, and Okay, so I guess the, uh, the question was, could an infecting virus actually bring a dead cell back to life? Um, now, I haven't seen this in the Scientific American article, so I'm just going to have to wing it here. Um, so the idea from our questioner is that um, a dying cell, one of the hallmarks of a dying cell is that the DNA starts to break down the cellular process called uh, apoptosis. And uh, the idea is that could you in infect with a virus that would reverse that process. Now, there are certain viral gene products that inhibit sort of the signals or the molecules that actually are involved in killing cells. But I'm not aware of one where you could actually sort of, after the deed is done, and that, that apoptosis, the cell death program, has been triggered and the DNA is actually breaking down that you could put in a virus that would be able to sort of ligate everything back together and the sort of precise organization and uh, reconstitute that cell. So viruses have gene products that will block cell death, but I don't think, I'm not sure that they have products or ways of actually bringing cells that are really dead back to life. Okay, one more related question. Yeah, they mentioned that uh, viruses can like reassemble after the DNA was destroyed, the viral DNA. And they can reassemble, like come back from that virus back to like... Well, that's a, so that, that sort of brings up a, an interesting point, which was uh, sort of the... Can we synthesize a virus from scratch? And uh, this sort of gets at an interesting question, both in terms of you know, biological defense and also virology. And it sort of gets at your question, well, if you just took a viral genome and sort of broke it up into pieces, could you actually reassemble that into a functional virus? And the, the bottom line is that, yeah, we have the capability to do that now. Viruses don't necessarily do that on their own. But with the kind of methods that we have and recombinant DNA technologies that we have, we can do that. So for instance, one of the 
one of the striking uh, publications on this was in, I believe it was in 1998, from Eckhard Wimmer, who's at Stony Brook. And what uh, Eckhard Wimmer showed, and this was published in Science to a great cry of controversy, was that, okay, poliovirus. We know a lot about poliovirus. We know the sequence of poliovirus. Every nucleotide in the genome, we know it. So if you just took that information and the ability to actually make DNA sequences synthetically on an oligonucleotide synthesizer, could you actually recreate a functional polio genome? And the answer to that is, of course you can. I mean, it's just sort of, you know, it's DNA, it's RNA. So if you assemble a DNA sequence that mimics the sequence of the polio virus genome, and then you use an enzyme in the test tube to transcribe an RNA that looks identical to the polio virus genome, and you transfect that into cells, you get polio virus. So, I mean, there is the ability to take sequence information and using these synthetic methods to actually make an infectious virus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you didn't make an invention of uh, interferon, have they harnessed uh, their information on interferon yeah, as that's an a, antiviral That's a fascinating mechanism? story. So the, the question is about interferon. And, you know, you would get guess from its name that interferon is something that interferes with something sort of was originally found to interfere with things like cell growth. But it actually is, is a very effective sort of cellular antiviral mechanism. So when these viruses go into cells, they can't do it completely silently. So for instance, if when a viral genome starts to replicate, let's say you're an RNA virus and it makes a complementary RNA, it generates double-stranded RNA. So that there are molecules in the cell that detect double-stranded RNA and they turn on this pathway called the interferon pathway. And once interferon is turned on, it's a protein that's secreted from cells. It binds to a receptor on other cell types. That cascade of events turns on about 500 other genes, of which we know about maybe a handful, as to how they exert either antiviral, antimicrobial efficacy. Um, so it's an amazing system that we still don't know um, a lot about the details of. But if you treat cells with interferon, many viruses are uh, unable to replicate in them. On the other hand, viruses have not been asleep, again, to get a little anthropomorphic. They have all kinds of whistles and bells that allow them to either block the induction of this double-stranded RNA-activated pathway that I told you about, or block the ability of interferon signaling to turn on these 500 genes that it doesn't want turned on. So there's sort of a dynamic interplay that goes on between viruses and the interferon system. Now, in terms of treatment, I guess, you know, getting back to one of my favorites, hepatitis C, is that for hepatitis C, interferon is used to treat people, and uh, in particular type 1 interferons. And, you know, as you might imagine, if interferon was completely benign, we'd just be making lots of interferon all the time. And the, the problem is that interferon creates all these flu-like symptoms. So it has actually pretty bad side effects. But in the case of hepatitis C, this is the really the only treatment that we have today in combination with a nucleoside analog called ribavirin. So people that are being treated for hepatitis C basically have to be treated with, with uh, a, a stabilized version of interferon called pegylated interferon plus ribavirin for 6 to 12 months. And in that sort of treatment regimen, about half of the people uh, actually clear the virus. So they're cured of the virus. It's pretty amazing. Half the people don't, and that's why we're still working on hepatitis C. But interferon is really an amazing um, cellular antiviral defense system that operates not in a virus-specific way, like the antibodies and the cytotoxic T cell do, but in a more nonspecific way. This is called the sort of part of the innate immune system. Over there. Yeah, I mean, there are people that love to uh, sort of uh, argue about, um, you know, virus taxonomy and where they came from. And uh, I can't really give you, you know, a, a great answer there. Um, as I sort of said at the end of the, the first session, I mean, my guess is that sort of viruses and virus-like agents have have been around since the inception of biology. 
Um, certainly, you know, in terms of viruses that infect humans, some are newer than others. I mean, some of these retro elements that are present in the genome have been with us for a long time. Others, like HIV, have had sort of a more um, recent entry into the human population within the last 100 years. In terms of virus taxonomy, they're sort of classified. In the old days, viruses were sort of classified based on what they look like. And the, you know, when the electron microscope allows us to look at viruses, you know, they were sort of envelope, non-envelope. There was a time when um, the alpha viruses that I told you about at the beginning and the flavy viruses like yellow fever were all in the same family because they sort of, they, it was clear that they were envelope viruses and people knew that they had an RNA genome. When people were able to then sort of sequence the genomes and find out that these viruses were actually quite different from one another, then they sort of, the taxonomy split them into two different families. Um, there's a very sort of complex classification scheme for viruses that's sort of in a, like the viruses themselves, in a continual state of, of evolution. But there are super families, families, there are genera, there are species. And then as you can imagine, for viruses like hepatitis C and HIV, within an individual, um, there's actually what we call quasi-species. So there, are, there is sort of an average sequence that you can determine for the virus population that's there, but each one of those viruses is different from the other one. So there are a swarm of variants there, which again gives the virus the power to respond to immune pressures and drugs. So that's sort of a vague answer, but yes, there is a very, uh, there is a classification system uh, there's a, a group called the uh, ICTV, which you can sort of do a Google on, and you'll get to their website, and you can uh, look at virus classification to your heart's content. Yeah. Could you tell us what, from the experience of the swine flu fiasco, the swine flu vaccine, what do, what uh, does our research of vaccines now uh, care, uh, bear from that experience? Well, you know, there, there, yeah, there are a lot of issues here in terms of, like, you know, this year's vaccine shortage that I think are worth thinking about. Um, one thing that's true of, of vaccines is that, you know, they, they are relatively difficult to develop a new one. With flu, you know, you've got to come up with something new every year. So that really sort of sets the clock. Sometimes you guess right about which strains are going to be circulating and which aren't. So there's a lot of science in terms of, of you know, coming up with the best vaccine. And once you've sort of finished doing that, then there's the sort of commercial aspects of it and the production aspects of it. And, you know, in the case of, of uh, this year and Chiron and the flu vaccine, I mean, there was a problem with manufacturing and, I guess, bacterial contamination in the facility so that it got shut down and basically... We were on the edge in terms of getting our 100,000 doses. 50,000 of these disappeared. We didn't have 50,000 that were made in excess. So, I mean, one of the things that can be done is to, you know, just pay for extra flu vaccine. So, have better control over production. Make an excess of it, uh, you know, so that if, you know, one, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, and, uh, you know, then I think these things won't happen. In, in a sense, the sort of problem that we've had this year is a very important wake-up call for vaccine development uh, in general. One of the problems that this has as a sort of commercial issue is that vaccines are not very profitable. That's why pharmaceutical companies are not that interested in them. Um, and, you know, vaccines can have side effects. And, uh, you know, a few uh, lawyers that are convincing in court can, uh, can basically uh, wipe out, you know, the profits, profits of a vaccine program. So I, I think it's really going to take a public health mandate to say, okay, we want to produce these vaccines for the public. They need them. And, uh, you know, we're going to pay for them one way or another. Because uh, on the swine flu vaccine, I think uh, they spent uh, the budget of almost $126 million at the time to gas while they were funding around the only $45 million from the CDC on the AIDS research at the time. Yeah. So I think that there has to be more, I mean, uh, a great deal of uh, public uh, pressure for, for public health 
Yeah, sure. But right now, as the Times article the 18th this month, the region is unable to counter a biological hit. So we need to uh, be prepared. I mean, the people have to wake up. And you yeah. need political will. Yeah, no, I mean, I think this really is something that's going to have to come from the public. I think that, you know, from a scientist's point of view, our ability to sort of make these vaccines is, is at a level, you know, where it's never been before. I mean, the, uh, the SARS outbreak, for instance, there are already a number of different uh, good candidate SARS vaccines out there. It's been a matter of a few years. Um, some of these other strategies that allow you to sort of make these things more quickly that are going to, where you know they're going to be attenuated and effective. Um, so the science is there, but I think the, you know, part of it is, you know, basically public health and government and these are very important issues. And, and you know, the public does have to get involved and I think the scientists also need to be willing to communicate what some of the issues are with the public. Yeah. Uh, we're able to survive given that uh, they have proteins in their coat and they're held together, like their tertiary structure is held together by hydrogen bonds and your DNA is also uh, very fragile when it comes to pH well, and temperature. Well, you know, they have, uh, that's a great question. So I guess you're sort of getting at the chemistry of this now. I mean, the bottom line is that, you know, these guys have sort of evolved under those conditions. So they have like thermostable proteins uh, in them. I don't think there's anything different about the DNA. As long as it's protected in the protein shell, it's okay. And actually, this is a very um, interesting source for structural biologists because you can get these proteins that are very thermostable. So let's say, for instance, I wanted to to express a sulfalobus protein and determine its structure. Well, I could overexpress it in E. coli where it's easy to do and then basically all I have to do is take the bacteria that I've grown up and boil them. Everything else just sort of denatures and falls out of solution for the reasons that you are getting at and the sulfalobus protein is still sitting there. And that's the origin of this enzyme called TAC polymerase that you probably have heard about that's used for the polymerase chain reaction. It's from Thermus aquaticus. It's from one of these, these uh, microorganisms, bacteria, that grows in this extreme environment. Very stable enzyme to temperature. So it, it allows it to work at you know, 70, 80, 90 degrees centigrade. So it's evolution and action is the answer. Yeah? It would seem to me that the answer to the second question could easily come from studying the genome of the viruses in the extremophile population. Because if their genome is similar to the bacterial genome, then it could indicate, possibly indicate, that that's where they arose. They rose from bacteria that didn't make it or somewhere down the line. Yeah, yeah. and there's a lot of... And is there any information? Yeah, there's a whole sort of... For these guys, it's a little new, but for, you know, bacteriophage in general, there's a whole zoo of sort of phylogenetic information because That's have, come from a, sort of yeah. comparing yeah. these genome sequences of these different isolates. And I guess, you know, without getting into the specifics, one of the things that's been learned is that there's an amazing amount of genetic exchange that goes on between these guys and their bacterial hosts. Um, just about every combination of things that you can imagine uh, is out there. It's a zoo. Transduction to the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think that, you know, I'll stick around for a while if anybody else wants to ask questions, but I think we better wrap it up. Thank you.